Okay, um, should I use the microphone or can you all hear me when I'm standing? Okay, how is that? Um, hill forts are a very diverse phenomenon. We heard about the Heunischen book before in the short introduction with the stone wall um, fortification with like Mediterranean uh, influences to it, which is only a very short lived um, thing. On the other side, I put a picture of the of the Ipf and Bopfing, which is also like a Bronze Age hill fort that even transitions to a princely seat of the early Iron Age um, and then later to a Celtic Oppida. And you see it has like many walls and many different phases of fortification and it's been used for a long time and renewed for a long time. I'll just show you these two pictures to remind you that fortifications are a diverse phenomenon. So what I will try to do is I will look at the Bronze Age fortifications and try to isolate some factors that might be um, unifying to them. I have one more slide to show how different um, the actually uh, setup and connections of hill forts are. We have three hill forts that exist in the same time frame and we have a rough mapping of possibly uh, Bronze Age settlements next to it and you see some of these hill forts um, are connected closely to settlement chambers and if you look at the Heunischen book that's a very isolated dot there um, we have hill forts that are not connected or does not seem to connect it directly to a settlement chambers or um, settlement um, landscapes. So hill forts appear in various landscapes, shapes and sizes. There are two things I want to mark out. Hill forts are part of the infrastructure of conflict. Um, we should turn away from a pacified view of the past and we should turn away from um, seeing hill forts as being mainly representative or something like that because there could be other means of representation to build these large-scale ditches, earthworks to even these um, fortified hinterlands or forelands like we've seen in the example um, just shown to us um, makes it clear that conflict was the main goal. The other one is that Hillfords emerge from socio-economic networks. They do not exist on their own. Um, for the Bronze Age, we have a very, very interdependent um, economic sphere, economic networks, and people and villages, they need to act in these networks. They need to get bronze, they need to get, to get copper and tin, and so they're entangled in these. Um, to understand the social dimension of Hillforts, we should not try to look for the elites, we should not try to look for traces of the elites on the, um, on the Hillforts itself all the time. We should um, make sense of how the increased interactions and dependencies might have reflected back on society and what might have driven the Bronze Age societies, um, or what, have, what might have been the conflicts within um, Bronze Age societies. If we talk about hill forts, we often um, talk about territories and borders. And normally in archaeology, our understanding of a territory is very limited to the physical space. We look to the next mountain ridge and we say, okay, the hill fort could have ruled the space to this part. But um, what we see is that we have like an overlapping, we have like layers of different territories and influence spheres. Um, that be connected to hillforts. There's an economical territory, there's an agricultural area that supports the hillfort, there's a military territory where you can act with your military power, however big or small this is, and in the end there's the physical territory that might also limit you. And the interesting part is these spheres are not always overlapping. We have, I put a hill fort there as an anchor point and you see the different spheres can be oriented in different regions, they can be oriented in different parts of physical space, just being anchored at the hill forts. And we can even imagine that there are spheres, spheres of influence that have just been linked to other spheres. Um, and another thing, if we think about these spheres, we have to think about them as networks. We have networks on these various layer, like the economic network a Hillfort um, works in, or a military network. And then if you see these dotted lines, these networks are three-dimensional. We have interconnections between all of these networks that are actually um, very important that we need to think of. And every um, interconnection, especially between these networks, may serve as a bottleneck. Keep the term in mind. We come back to that later. So another concept I want to talk of is flows of goods. And flows of goods are important because um, goods tend to traverse through space and um, to be on a good um, 
you know, to be connected to flows of goods is very important as we think of socio-economical networks. I will skip this slide and we're coming to the urban flow theory right away. So, um, flows of goods are often connected to urbanization and urban flow theory. And this is a process that starts in space. I will not argue that Bronze Age hillforts are urban at all, but I want that we view them as part of urbanization as a long-term process that in the end leads to Iron Age, Oppida and other <coughs> phenomenon. So, flows of goods drift towards an area. And God's goods can be raw materials, finished product, but even people's ideas or innovation, or some authors just describe them as energy that flows through space. And these streams can accumulate in certain areas and causing changes to the economic and social space and dimensions that they flow through, that they hit through. So these flows um, can change spaces as a double. Um, this change in spaces can lead to the formation of new institutions. And I will try to show to you what I mean with an institution, how I think these come together. Because we need institutions to regulate conflicts of interests and stabilize these various spaces and spheres I showed you before. Because only if they are stable, they can be long-term connected to urban flows. Um, and the concentration of institutions will eventually, further down the road, lead to a more dense urbanized area like we later get in the medieval city or the Iron Age Oppida. So um, when we think about the social space, we always think about hierarchies. We always see these as a pyramid. And we also see these as very static. So you cannot make it from the bottom to the top of the hierarchy. Never can you leave um, your, um, your level of social um, um, status. I don't think it is like this. We should more think of it as dotted line. There is a possibility to crawl up the social ladder to a certain extent. And if we really think about it in terms of complexity science, society might look more like this. It might not even be stratigraphically layered. Things might be, um, how you say, like interconnected. These um, social spaces might not be flat, might not be even. Um, we can follow this with a very um, simple thought experiment. Um, imagine these are we, we, all the people in the room here right now, and all of us will self-identify as archaeologists. That's why you're here, that's why you're at EAA. Now, as we all have studied archaeology, some of us will listen to metal music. So this is a smaller group of us self-identifying as probably heavy metal fans. Within these heavy metal fans, we might find a smaller group of Bronze Age researchers self-identifying as archaeologists, as heavy metal fans, and then as Bronze Age researchers, and two or three of us might also be Hillfort enthusiasts. But you see, within a broader social space, there are various <coughs> subgroups, there are various identities and entities, and um, being connected to such an identity might also influence the outcome of, um, um, of your acting, of your social acting. So um, there's a very um, simple example I took from Taylor, who's a social geographer, and he said there's always two um, diverging powers in a the population. There are the more bound to place people. Let's see, these are the the um, the agriculturists, the production people that actually do the agriculture, that try to support with their surplus all these economic networks, and then we have the metal traders, we have the metal workers, and they being like the more mobile people. While a farmer is bound to place, he has to live on his farmstead, he has to guard his farmstead. The, um, the trader might be able to go to another um, territory to trade somewhere else. So they are more distributors, they are more flexible, they are more global thinking, while the agriculturalists are more um, mostly producers and they think local and probably being a little bit more conservative and um, trying to guard their homesteads and their farmsteads. So this will create tension within a society and these tension needs new superior institutions to regulate this conflict, to try to um, um, get society to work together to get into um, what you say a unified idea of stuff. So I would argue Hillforts could be such institutions because they can stabilize regions and might therefore play a key role within stabilizing spaces, make it possible to flows of goods to traverse through the territory and stay in the territory longer. Because if I have a peaceful region, if I have a region where I'm sure I can um, um, 
go out and um, reach out to an institution to regulate conflicts, I would be more inclined to trade with such a region. Stable regions, therefore, have a higher gain from the flows of goods that traverse to their territories. So it makes sense for me, as a community, to invest in a hill fort to show that I'm be ready to defend my territories, to be ready to um, probably even like act radical on my own ideas, go out and wage war if I really want to have something, if I want to have a gain, because the flows will stay, um, will come to my territory and will stay longer there. I can siphon off like a surplus. I can get something from interacting in these bottlenecks, maybe even create my own bottleneck where it was not given before because of um, the way the trade routes were before I tried to pacify my territory. Um, these emergent institutions might restructure social space to those within and without the hill forts, those living in there, those being on the outside, but they have a tremendous outcome. And it's not about the hill fort itself. The building of hill fort will not give me the institution, but the institutions will um, monument monumentalize themselves in these hill forts. They will show of their power by building a hill fort, by having this focal point of coming conflicts, because if I want to come and raid your area, I have to get past your hill fort. So um, building these primary military um, places in the first place will also give me a long-term gain from a better trade routes, from a better placement in the socio-economic networks that drive the Browse Age. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>